My name is Corey Navis. I am a third year PhD student in ICON and uh, the Warren L School of Forestry and Natural Resources. And uh, yeah, well, not all of us are currently located in Georgia either. Um, my work is a little bit closer to home uh, for where most of us are centered. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the uh, ongoing and then future directions of my dissertation research um, centered around the striped newt in South Georgia. So I'll be talking about a little bit uh, that ecological research. So buckle in icon community. We are going to talk some natural science, but I believe in you all. We can get through this. Um, then I'll be shifting to uh, talk about the role of the public lands um, in these conservation efforts and sort of the future directions where I'm hoping to take that aspect of my research. So when we think about uh, globally really important biodiversity hotspots, right, we often don't think of South Georgia, right? We think of uh, places in the tropics, uh, often island locations with a lot of, um, where a lot of speciation has happened and there's a lot of endemic species. But when we think about salamanders in particular, this, the Eastern and particularly Southeastern United States actually is a really important global um, biodiversity hotspot. So you can see on that map there, I know it's kind of small uh, zoomed in, but a lot of that has to do with um, the Appalachian Mountains. So as those developed, a lot of salamander species of certain clades in particular were getting um, divided up, speciating. So that's part of what has contributed to a lot of the salamander diversity in this region. Uh, but taking a little closer zoom in, um, these maps unfortunately don't break down by salamanders in particular, but for all amphibians, uh, you can see a cluster there and sort of a distinction uh, along the coastal plains of southeastern um, the United States. So if you are familiar at all with Georgia, uh, sort of ecosystems and geology, which if you stick around here long enough, people will make sure you are, uh, you'll know that that line is demarcating the fall line. So that's that ancient geological feature um, that demarcates the differences in uh, underlying geology. So the uh, you see different soil types um, from the Piedmont region and then the coastal plain that is a lot more sandy, um, a lot, you know, less elevation and we'll see different vegetation assemblages between those two regions and often different communities of animals as well. And we definitely see that pattern in amphibians and reptiles. So that brings us to the star of my research, uh, the striped newt, which is uh, endemic to the coastal plain in the southeastern United States. So specifically just in South Georgia and then the north and central parts of Florida. So this is pretty unique. We only have two uh, genera of newts in North America. So newts, we'll give a little background because sometimes this throws people off. All newts are salamanders, not all salamanders are newts. Uh, so newts are a certain subfamily of salamander. And we only have two um, genera of those in North America. So when we think about uh, this genus, Nothalamus, and the three species in Eastern North America, we're talking about ancient lineages, right? These little tiny salamanders that are, you know, maybe eight centimeters long total, their ancestors came over the Bering Land Bridge. So this is a, a lineage with a really long and very cool history. Um, there's only three species in this genus in the Eastern part of the United States. And this is definitely much more rare um, than for instance, the Eastern newt that a lot of people might be more familiar with and is really widespread across Eastern North America. So this map here shows some surveys um, done in the recent in the last decade or so based on some ground truth things. So actually going out and visiting um, known or reported striped newt uh, breeding ponds and sites where they'd been seen in the past, checking on some historical records. Um, some of those didn't have great location data and then also reporting back on sites where maybe ponds had been degraded or destroyed. And so they're pretty sure uh, newts were no longer occurring there. So you can see there are a number of spots in um, 
few in the panhandle and then into north central florida but in georgia and i know this is a this map is very not um color blindness friendly so in case that uh, is a challenge for anyone um just to key you in there's only about four locations in Ge four or five spots in georgia Mm, excuse me, in South Georgia, where they're believed to still be existing. So this one on the uh, upper left is the main research site that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. Um, and then there are a few other locations here um, designated in green that are mostly on public lands. So that includes Fort Stewart, a few other wildlife management areas that are run by the Georgia DNR, um, as well as one private property where they had been detected. So similar is the case in Florida as well, um, that most of the sites where conservation of this species is concentrated are located on um, public lands, whether those are federal or uh, state owned. So anytime we're taking on a conservation effort, and there are a number of entities in the region working on striped newt conservation, we're going to want to be thinking of some basic questions, right? Where do we direct our conservation resources? What action are we going to take? Um, and then how is that action expected to impact our objectives, whatever that may be? Um, so in this case, it might be increasing the population or um, reestablishing striped newts at a site where they were recently extirpated. In order to know those things or be able to predict those answers, you need to know some basic data on the species. So part of my objectives in uh, the ecological research that I'm conducting on striped newts is to build a working population model for the species, which doesn't exist yet. Um, and if, you know, this, the thought of a population model gives you nightmares and flashbacks to coding and, you know, feel like you can't grasp that, we're going to go through the very basic 101 level because you probably actually do have a sense of how this works. Um, so if you think about headlines you've heard about, uh, you know, global human population should reach a certain number by the end of the century, or a story saying, you know, this population of an animal species is expected to decline and go extinct by 2050. That's all based on these kind of population model predictions. So in order to make those kind of predictions, we need to know some basic things about whatever organism or community we're talking about. So understanding those different life stages, right? With humans, we know that we have different life stages. Animals, right? Put a frog here because it's a pretty simple one most of us are familiar with. Um, so understanding what those life stages are, the amount of time an individual spends in each of those life stages, and then probabilities of them surviving to reach the next life stage as well as some other things like um, sex ratios, reproductive rates, and lifespans uh, that allow us to make those kinds of predictions on whether a population is going to be increasing, decreasing, is stable, um, or how certain actions might impact that population. So I put up these very simple life cycles first because when we get into striped newts, it's a little more complicated. Uh, so, I won't get into all of the details of this, but the long story short is uh, sort of this outside developmental route um, is typical of all newts. Uh, they have usually have this uh, terrestrial juvenile eft phase where they go wander around on land for a few years, do their thing uh, before they mature and return to breeding ponds to breed. Uh, striped newts also have the option, uh, if their wetland remains ponded year round and doesn't dry up, of staying in this pedomorph or basically um, juvenile form where they undergo partial metamorphosis. So they retain their big bushy gills that you saw in that earlier picture, um, that tail fin, some of those juvenile characteristics, but they also mature reproductively. So they're able to breed within the very first year of life in that coming breeding season and just stay in the pond. Um, so that makes, you know, plugging in all of these rates and probabilities a little bit more complicated. And a lot of the in-depth studies that have been done about striped newts, and there are not many of them, have been focused on captures of either efts migrating out of the pond at the end of their larval summer, um, and then adults migrating out after breeding or returning back the next year to breed. So really missing out on a lot of those dynamics of what's going in, on in the pond um, and things like survival rates of the larva, the pedomorphs, 
and the odds that they might develop down one route or another. So it's really hard to make predictions of, for instance, um, if we captive rear X number of newts to this certain life stage and introduce them, how is that going to impact the population? Um, is it even necessary or is the population now stable? A lot of those evaluations aren't really able to be made right now um, by groups that are working on the species conservation. So in order to get at some of those gaps in information, I have been uh, going down to this large breeding pond at Sand Hills Wildlife Management Area, um, which was the one I had pointed out first on the map there, that most northwest uh, breeding site known in Georgia. It's actually just over the fall line. And uh, sampling for striped newts, collecting demographic data and uh, marking individuals for recapture. Um, unfortunately, haven't been getting a lot of those back yet, um, but I'm hoping to be able to get some data on, you know, what happens to them over time, how those different life stages um, interact and interplay with each other. I also have some striped newts uh, in captivity at the moment for captive rearing. You can see this female, um, it's very small here, but has actually in the process and has already laid some eggs um, individually on this aquarium plant. Um, that's another reason that it's hard to know things like clutch size for these um, because they do lay eggs individually on plants as opposed to like you may have seen frog or salamander egg masses uh, all clumped together if you've you know, been strolling out through any Georgia pond. Uh, we actually just had our first babies of those hatching in the last couple weeks. So those larvae, after being reared up a little while, um, we'll be releasing back into enclosures uh, at this main pond and then at another uh, research location um, that striped newts are native to so that we can monitor some of those things like survival rates and developmental pathways um, that we can that will help inform those models that can be used as a tool in conservation decision making around this species. So take a look at that nice big pond. Zooming back out to a little context of where that's located. So like I mentioned, that is at Sand Hills WMA. Um, you can see uh, where we are at UGA, at least some of us here in spirit. Um, and then the other release site is a little bit further south in Georgia. Um, but I'm going to be mainly talking about sandhills there because that's where I've been doing the population research. Um, that's really the best, uh, most robust, stable striped new population that we believe to be in Georgia right now. Um, and is what really got me thinking about some of these issues of public land and um, you know, how, how properties come to be places that we dedicate primarily for species conservation. So it's an absolutely gorgeous property. Um, it's currently being uh, actively restored back into more of that uh, pine savanna habitat that used to be much more common across this part of the Southeast. But it hasn't always existed as a haven for striped newts, right? So I've been thinking about um, the history of this land and how it came to be. So things that I'm interested in digging more into are that socio-ecological history. Um, so how have people been using and interacting with this particular place, um, you know, over the centuries or millennia that people have been inhabiting this region? Um, what are the people that use that land now? So the area of residents, um, people who maybe come on to hunt, or um, wish they could use the land for other purposes. What do they know of that history and how does that impact their perspectives on it being managed primarily for species conservation now? And how does that maybe impact their interactions with the land these days? So zooming back in, I put a little marker there to orient you to that breeding pond, but Sand Hills WMA is a pretty interesting spot. Um, so this is just near the town of Butler, Georgia, which is population about 2,000 people just under. So not a huge community, um, but it is the biggest community in Taylor County, which is very rural. Um, you can see there's a sand quarry up to the north there. And uh, on three sides there, it is surrounded by solar facility. So this property was actually only acquired by the Georgia DNR in 2007. 
and it is managed primarily for species conservation. Unlike a lot of WMAs, we think about um, a lot of game management and hunting. Uh, you actually can't, as a member of the general public, drive onto this WMA. Um, so people, you know, will walk in, do uh, small game hunting, or you know, just a little bit of trucking around uh, for a leisurely afternoon, but there isn't a lot of public access. That's not the um, primary focus of this property. So despite being really located close to the town, surrounded by a lot of other uses of land, um, you know, choices have been made for this property um, in terms of its focus on uh, species, which is not just striped newts, but in other, other assemblages of rare um, animals and plant species in the region as well. So um, there are some things that I've already been thinking about the history of that uh, area, but in addition to continuing my population research on the species, I'm going to be digging into some more of that historical research. So finding out the specifics of um, beyond just the things I know already about the dynamics and history of that region, um, but really honing into what has this land been used for before. Um, I, I don't know what all the questions are yet that I will get to because some of those uh, histories may raise more questions that I want to get perspectives on. Um, but hopefully as the pandemic is uh, getting a little more under control as we're all hopefully getting vaccinated soon, uh, I'll be able to set up a little more easily some interviews with area residents, land managers, other stakeholders to get at both um, the histories of that land and people's perspective on how that land is being used and some of those dynamics that might be at play. So I just wanna quickly uh, thank you know, my, and acknowledge my, uh, you know, program and home department, as well as some of my funders and then uh, collaborators that have helped with this project, as well as the many people who have um, been out to assist me in both the field and the lab. And if any of you have questions, I would be happy to take them or Rather, you can put them in the chat and I'm sure Jeff will pass them along, um, but my email is there as well. You are welcome to get in touch later. Even with cutting out like half my slides, I could talk about striped newts for much longer than this. So uh, definitely get in touch if you would like to talk more. Thank you, Corey. We have time for a question or two if you want to put it uh, in the chat. Okay, so Katie asked the question about, oh, Lots of lots of things coming in. Okay, so Katie uh, wants to ask about uh, your captive breeding, breeding program and whether you have any uh, concerns with actual accidental introduction or spreading of diseases uh, into the new populations from it. So that is a great question. Um, so these are going to be uh, going back into most of them into the same. Um, property where they the um, individuals were collected from. So these are newts from sandhills that were brought into captivity for breeding. Um, and possibly no one is more anal than me about ensuring that uh, nothing that touches any other animal touches them. Um, so we have been really diligent about making sure that they are um, you know, not getting anything else introduced into those uh, breeding communities. Um, but we also, um, one of the folks that's been helping me in the field has been uh, doing some sampling at Sandhills on salamanders for her um, senior thesis in Warnell on disease transmission. So we'll also be able to use some of that data to um, help us make sure that there's not anything unique that we would be introducing from that population, say, to um, when we eventually do some releases at the other WMA as well. <laughs> 